You don't often have a speaker begin by asking your forgiveness. But I did come here straight from a hard day of skiing in Vail. So, you know, if I slouch, lean on the podium, my mind wanders, and thus, in this case, my speech wanders. Although it's really attributable to age, I can blame it on a good day of skiing at Vail. But you're not here to hear about a, a, a ski hill, you know, what, 80 miles to the west. We're going to talk about a bigger ski hill, what, 11 time zones right now, 11 time zones to the east, known as the Winter Olympics in Sochi. And what they say about President Putin and about the nation and the nation's people. Let me begin with a show of hands. How many of you in the last couple of weeks have turned on your TV even once and watched any of the Winter Olympics? Raise your hands, please. And leave them up for a moment. Okay, looks like almost everybody. Leave them up if during the opening ceremony, during, during the, uh, the ice hockey game, the ice dancing, uh, if you saw a picture uh, you know, of, of those two toilets between in a single stall, if during any of that you saw President Putin. Leave your hands up if you saw President Putin. Okay, some have gone down, but plenty saw him. Leave your hands up if even once you saw him smile. <laughs> For the first goal, he smiled. And then we scored twice. But that's what's amazing. Because these were his Olympics. I mean, this was his time. His big show. The last time, of course, his country, then the Soviet Union, hosted the Olympics, the United States didn't even come. So this was his chance to say, if you thought that Russia had descended to the depths of a second-hand power, you're wrong. You know, we're big, we're back. Because big is a very important concept in Russia. Things are big in Russia, they're good. I mean, that, they equate the two. I had a column oh, maybe a month ago in the Denver Post, about Putin in anticipation of the Olympics. And about the concept of big. Now, it's 600 words. You can't say a lot. 600 words. I feel like somebody's got their hand around my neck. But I pointed out, for example, how many of you have ever been in Russia? Okay, probably a quarter, a third of you. You might know, if you've been there, I'm sure you've been in Moscow. The Kremlin is right in the middle of the city and is surrounded by ring roads, ring road number one, ring road number two, number three, in an ever wider radius from the center of, <clears throat> of uh, Moscow, which is the Kremlin. And there are ring roads that are eight lanes wide, four lanes in each direction. That's big. The funny thing is, they've been around since long before Russia became the country we're talking about. And in the days of the Soviet Union, precious few people owned a private vehicle. I mean, I used to do a lot of work out in front of the Kremlin, and I always felt I could have done push-ups in the middle of this eight-lane boulevard and wouldn't have been hurt. But big was important, so they had these great big boulevards that were almost empty. They have these, they're called the Seven Sisters, seven monolithic skyscrapers in their day. They've since been outpaced by a, they've got a couple of pods of steel and glass skyscrapers these days. But these were buildings put up in the days of Stalin, and they they, they convey Stalinesque strength. They're impenetrable. They're, 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 they're intimidating. The Seven Sisters. You, one of them is the Foreign Ministry. One of them is called the Hotel Ukraine. They might change the name in view of the relationship these days. But big is symbol of good. I was at the Paris Air Show in the early 1980s one year. And the Soviet Union, still the Soviet Union until 1991, <clears throat> had promoted the fact that it was going to make its Western debut with what would be the largest military aircraft on Earth. Now, the United States uh, had won that award with the C-5 Galaxy, built in those days by Lockheed. And so everyone at the show was waiting for it to come, and it was announced that it was on approach. <clears throat> and as it got close, jaws dropped. Jaws dropped because it was almost, with the exception of part of the tail section, it was almost a carbon copy of the C-5, which in those days was no surprise. There was a lot of industrial and military espionage, but it was 28 feet longer than the longest plane, which was ours. So now they had the biggest. Big is important. It was the way of the Soviet Union demonstrating the superiority of its system. 
Now, I, I'm not saying this to you alone. People who have written books about it have reached the same conclusion. But you only had to work there as a journalist, as a diplomat, in the commercial world to understand that they treasured big, almost over and above everything else. And so when the Soviet Union went away, Russia kind of inherited that culture for itself. And that would help explain the size of Sochi, the size of everything they built, spending $50 billion. That's not the official. The official uh, account is 12 to $13 billion. But in fact, all the reliable estimates are about $50 billion which I just read yesterday, just parenthetically, is more than all previous Olympics combined. Hard to believe, and I didn't check it out, but it's interesting to contemplate. So, getting the Olympics for Putin was big. It was big. It was, you know, it's like Obama getting unanimous approval of Obamacare on both sides of the aisle. I mean, it was a big, big thing. It was like Hollande, the president of France, getting a date. It was really, really big. <laughs> And yet, if you watched the opening ceremony, where Putin was shown many times on NBC, I mean, he looked about as excited when the hundreds strong uh, Russian delegation of, of, of athletes and trainers and others came out of the tunnel into that huge arena, and he looked about as excited as a man to whom you just offered a stick of gum. There's a book called Man With No Face. And guess what? It's a book about Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. So what I want to talk to you about tonight is Putin and his influence on Russia and, in a way, Russia's influence on him because he's the man with no face. But if you've been watching the Olympics, and there have been, of course, many exceptions, but basically watch the Russian athletes versus the Western athletes. They are like the people with no face. And there's a reason for it. Some of you did. It showed the grand sweep, and it was beautifully done. The grand sweep of Russian culture and history. And there were a couple of technological flubs, but basically it was very, very impressively presented. And so there was ballet, and there was opera, and there was the industrialization, which was an impressive feat in, uh, in, in Russia in its day. But what you learned, and they covered up a few of their dark spots, but we would do the same if we were presenting the grand sweep of American history. Those people have had very little to laugh about. And that's important to understand. They've had things to smile about, things that have given them pride, but very little to laugh about. Dostoevsky, the, 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 the Russian novelist from the 19th century, he wrote this. He wrote, the most basic, most rudimentary spiritual need of the Russian people is the need for suffering ever-present, unquenchable, everywhere and in everything. These people have put up, not just recently, not just in our lifetime, but for centuries, they've put up with harsh weather. They've put up with harsh leaders. They've put up with harsh rules. They've put up with harsh famines. They've put up with harsh invaders. They have had very little to laugh about, and that shapes Russia to this very day. That's not to shortchange their strong culture and their very powerful history and their many great achievements. But it is to say that they take them differently than we take ours. Their greatest achievement in modern times, I'd say, one of the two anyway, is the space program. Those of you who, I mean, most of you probably know or even remember that the first human being in space was not an American. It was a Russian, Yuri Gagarin was his name, and he orbited the Earth before our first astronaut, Alan Shepard, who has a daughter who lives in Evergreen, made the suborbital flight to become the first American in space, up and down. And then a few months later, John Glenn went into the first American orbit. But, you know, they were the first in space. They put up the first uh, space station when our international space station, with which we now uh, uh, partner with the Russians, the Europeans, the Canadians, and the Japanese, but they put up a space station when ours was still on the drawing boards. They have great achievements in space. But a close look at their space program helps to illustrate the differences between the United States and, the, and, and Russia in terms of culture, in terms of ambition, and in terms of a few other things. Maybe 
three years ago, shortly before the American space shuttle stopped flying, I went to Russia to do an hour-long program on the Russian space program. And there were two things in particular that stood out as metaphors. One was this. You know, in the, in the American space program, NASA has three headquarters. One's the administrative headquarters in D.C. It's a block off the mall in Washington. One is the launch headquarters, which is the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on the East Coast. And one is the Johnson Space Center. That's where the astronauts live and train and so forth. Well, their equivalent to the Johnson Space Center is called the Yuri Gagarin Space Flight Center. We call it, uh, their nickname and ours in English is Star City. And it's buried in a birch forest, maybe 80 miles outside of Moscow. And it's buried in a birch forest because that's a reflection of the Cold War. In those days, they didn't want anybody knowing even where it was, let alone what was being done there. So to my great pleasure, because I mean, here I grew up in this country and, and came of age during the Cold War, and yet we got to go to Star City, a camera crew and me, to do this program. There is an American contingent at Star City. There, there, at the time, there were four American astronauts because, you know, the, uh, the space shuttle never delivered all the astronauts to the space station. It went and stopped, but basically brought the same ones home. Many American astronauts and Western astronauts for many years went up in the Soyuz aircraft, launched from Kazakhstan. In the Soyuz capsule, I should say, which was atop a Soyuz rocket. Soyuz means the Union in Russian. So everything's called Soyuz. And... They built in Star City three clabbered sort of New England style homes for the American astronauts and members of their families when they'd come. They're even surrounded by little, little picket fences. I mean, you don't see these <laughs> kinds of houses in the rest of Russia, at least where I've been. But I, I was interviewing the, the head of the, um, every six months the, the, the chief astronaut is rotated. So I was interviewing the guy who at the time ran the American contingent. We're in his office. We're not in one of these little houses. And I was asking him questions about all kinds of things. This was an hour-long program, but one of them was about the safety protocols, differences between U.S. and Russia. And he laughed, and he said, come with me. And he said to the camera crew as well, come on along. So the cameraman took the camera off the tripod, put it on his shoulder. We go into this guy's office, the American astronaut's office, and he, he, he activates his computer so we can see the screensaver. Now, here's the preface to what, I, what he showed me. When you're at the Kennedy Space Center for a launch, and I've seen Apollo launches there, and I've seen almost 40 space shuttle launches, everyone, with the, uh, there are a few people, a few people there for the utter worst case scenario uh, emergency, who are in a bunker just a few hundred yards from the pad in case just at the moment of launch, everything blows to smithereens. But then everyone else, the journalists, the VIPs, and launch control itself, are in a radius of 3.1 miles in a sort of semicircle to the west of the launch pad. And the thinking is, worst case scenario, this thing blows up on the pad, the shrapnel will not blow as far as 3.1 miles, so we're all supposed to be safe. It's never been tested, thank goodness, but we felt pretty safe at 3.1 miles. He activates his computer, and what is the screensaver? It's a picture of a Soyuz rocket lifting a Soyuz capsule into space, and there is a still photographer standing not 250 yards from the pad. I mean, smoke and flames and all the rest. I mean, I don't know how hot that, those flames are, but the space shuttle generated heat at the pad of 6,000 degrees, roughly the surface of the sun. This guy's 250 yards away, and he was not burned to a crisp. So the astronaut used this to demonstrate the following difference. He said, you know, in the United States, he, he said, their safety protocol, and in many ways that he explained to me, was different than ours. But he said, really, comes down to this. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. He said, in the United States, if somebody manufactures a spear, there will be a sticker on it that says, do not poke yourself in the eye with this sharp stick. <laughs> he said, in Russia, they just figure, if you do, you do, and hopefully you're smart enough not to. So that was one difference. But there, there is a, you know, we use the word here in the American West, rugged in, the phrase rugged individualism. Theirs is a different kind, but it's truly rugged individualism because you're very much on your own. The other metaphor is snow. Now, here in Genesee, in Evergreen where I live, all over the Front Range, and particularly in the mountains, we deal a lot with snow. We get plenty of snow during a 
part of the year, and people shovel their decks and vehicles plow the streets. We do what we can to mitigate the inconvenience and the discomfort of snow. My visit to Star City was in December, and as you know, December, in fact, winter, is a harsh w meteorological period in, uh, in northern Russia. They don't touch the snow. Driving in is like being on some little road 20 miles out of basalt. I mean, you're slipping and sliding, and your wheels drop into deep, foot deep ruts, you know, and you can't get out because that, those are the ruts that all the predecessor vehicles have, have, have trod. When you're in Star City itself, the buildings are all up on steps. All the buildings are up on steps. The steps are littered with big clumps of ice, and you have to negotiate around the ice to get to the buildings from the streets. You, it's, it, you know, when you, when you walk in deep snow around here, you do it there. The thing is, this is not evergreen. This is the heart and the source of Russia's, and for that, the Soviet Union's greatest technological, technological achievements, the space program. And yet they don't shovel the decks or plow the streets. Now, I've seen that in Moscow, but this was Star City, the Yuri Gagarin Space Flight Center. To me, something as simple as snow helps to define the culture of the country, which might help to explain why I say it's not a lighthearted country. They've had little to laugh about. It's not a lighthearted nation. The other significant achievement, of course, in modern times was this. For decades, people in the Soviet Union yearned for democracy. Now, democracy, as you're going to learn if you come, when's the speaker? Fourth of May, the, March. On the 4th of March, means different things to different people. But they yearned for something approximating what we would call democracy. And then, in 1991, after throwing off the yoke of a, of, of a repressive police state, they got it. But it did not last for long. What happened was this. In 1991, the Soviet Union fell apart, became Russia, and the, and the other and the stands and the other, the other independent countries. And for the first time in Russia, first time in, in, in history, they elected leaders at the local level, at the provincial level, provinces are their states, there are almost 100 of them, and at the, in, in, in the two houses of their Congress, the Duma. And the media flourished too, I'm happy to say. For the first time in the life of the country, uh, critical questions were openly asked and critical debates were publicly aired. But when Putin became president, eight or nine years later, he put the country into a political U-turn to the point where today the governors of the provinces who were for a couple of cycles elected are now appointed by the president. And guess what? The members of the upper house, the Senate, as we would call it, are appointed by the governors who are appointed by the president. So you can imagine they're not going to fall too far from the tree. The mayors of Moscow and, uh, and uh, Len Leningrad, uh, St. Petersburg, um, for a couple of cycles were elected. That too was taken away. The mayor of Moscow was just recently elected again, and I don't know what happened. Uh, the mayor of Leningrad is still an appointee. Political parties. There was the Communist Party. Full stop. When the Soviet Union fell apart, they blossomed to number something like 50. And then Putin got there and said, well, we're going to have certain qualifiers to be a political party. Translation, promote Putin's policies. So from 50, they went back down to about five. All pretty obedient to the principles of Vladimir Putin. And the media, enough of that has been shut down, you might have read about it, that is more like a puppy dog now. An analyst in Moscow who I've worked with many times over the many years that I've gone there uh, said to me that, that uh, in an email just a month or so ago, Putin has not been asked at a news conference, which occasionally he holds, but he has not been asked a critical, a judgmental question in many years. That is not to say that the Soviet state is being repeated today. It's not nearly as severe as it used to be. But 
For those of you who might not remember just how severe it was, or maybe you're too young to really know, let me tell you a quick story. As a matter of fact, I might as well promote my own book, Life in the Wrong Lane, which is really about all the wacky, stupid, funny, dangerous, I'll say stupid again, things that journalists like me do just to get to the point of reporting a story. That's what this is about. One of the stories I tell is this. International Human Rights Day, December 10th, uh, 1982. It's a long time since I've said 19-something. The United Nations established that date every year as International Human Rights Day to commemorate human rights conditions around the world. And I was in Moscow at our bureau, all the major, I worked for ABC News, and all the major networks and print organizations from the Western world had bureaus in Moscow, offices. And we got a message. I honestly don't remember how we got it, whether it was a cryptic handwritten note anonymously delivered or a telephone call, but we got a message one day on December 10th in the morning saying, be at Gorky Square at 4 o'clock. Now, Gorky, Maxim Gorky was a, 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 an author in the 19th and 20th centuries and a political activist. I think he helped create the concept of socialism. Anyway, so Gorky Square is yeah, half a mile from the Kremlin on Gorky Street, and there's a statue of Gorky in the middle of the square. Now, this is December 10th. Once again, this is a different December than the trip to Star City. But again, it is snowing to beat the band. It's the kind of snow I wish I had today in Vail. I mean, big, heavy snowflakes falling as thick as you can imagine. And it's for, so, so we decided we're going to go there. We're not going to ignore that message. And of course, all the news organizations were there. Gorky Square is on Gorky Street, and a bunch of bus lines stop there. And there's a subway stop there as well, where you go down the steps. So all the commuters from this commercial area are heading home. So there are people scurrying about, but it's snowing like crazy. So they're not just standing there in this bad weather. The only people who are standing there in this bad weather, already with an inch or two of snow on their shoulders, are all men. They're all wearing fedora hats. They're all wearing heavy overcoats. They're all wearing the very same shoes, government issue shoes. They were the KGB, the, the wonderful uh, state security service of the Soviet Union. And so now we knew that they too had gotten word that there was going to be some sort of commemoration of International Human Rights Day. But none of us knew what form it was going to take, where it was going to come from. People are running around trying to stay out of the weather and get on the bus. And suddenly, out of nowhere, and none of us, we, my colleagues and I talked about it afterwards, out of nowhere comes a woman holding a single flower. She steps up to the statue of Gorky. Gorky Square is not like Civic Center Plaza. It's not nearly that big. It's maybe four times as big as this room. And she steps up to the statue of Gorky with the flower. Now, the, the statue starts you know, about here, and then this is a big pedestal down here. And there's a base on the pedestal, and that's where she intends to put the flower. But at the base of the statue, at the bottom of the pedestal, I should say, there's a, there's a, there's a plot of dirt. It's frozen solid dirt, but there's a plot of dirt. And there's a little chain about a foot, foot and a half high around the plot of dirt. She goes like this, and immediately three of these guys with an inch of snow on their shoulder and the same government issue shoes, they might be here now grab her and bundle her away before we know what happened. But now we sort of know something's happening, and we're all standing around, the KGB as well as us. And a minute or two later, here comes a guy with a flower. And we see him coming, and nobody stops him, including the security service, until he's, let me see if I can, no, it didn't work this time. <laughs> and they bundle them away. Well, it happened three or four more times. <clears throat> We're all, you know, our camera crews are videotaping like crazy. And eventually the KGB attacks us. I won't tell you more. I want you to buy the book. It's for sale outside after the talk. <laughs> but, but that was a commemoration of International Human Rights Day in the Soviet Union. Now, that's history there. Things aren't as bad. And hopefully, they never will be again. But it's also the legacy, the culture of the country, the culture that produced Vladimir Putin. It was a culture in which people 
not just didn't, but really couldn't show their feelings on their sleeve. So it's made them a very stoic people. They've had to be. That's the only way they can get through their day. And don't forget, Vladimir Putin is a child of the Soviet Union, and, and if that doesn't speak volumes enough, before he went into politics, uh, he was an agent with, he was an officer of the, uh, of the uh, KGB. Exhibit A, Pussy Riot. How many of you know what Pussy Riot is? <clears throat> okay, most of you. It's, it's a girls, for those rest of you, a girls band, Russian girls band. Um, I think they're a punk band, I'm not sure. Frank Sinatra is still my favorite music. <laughs> but they are a, a, a band that a little over two years ago, they called, they called themselves a protest band. They had a protest in a church in Moscow, and they protested the association of Putin with, uh, with the state, not the state religion, but with this church. And they were, they were arrested. They were charged with hooliganism and hatred of religion. It was a, an anti-Putin protest. You know, you can have an anti-Obama protest, an anti-Bush protest before that. And they don't get arrested and put away for a couple of years. But they were. They were sentenced. As some of you probably know from news reports, just before Christmas, I should say just before Sochi, Putin got up one morning and said, let's let some of these people go. Because he knew that the world's spotlight was about to be on Russia, and he didn't want any more attention to human rights than he needed. So he let them go. What it demonstrated was Putin's authority, not just over the Kremlin, parliament, but over law enforcement, over the courts. Officially, he's not a communist. Officially, he's the president of the Russian democracy, and they do have still elections for the lower house and certain other positions. But you know what? He controls the place. He controls the place almost totally. So that was then. Let me tell you where things moved to in the present day. This is not in the book, but there might be a second book. I encourage you to watch for it. <laughs> Maybe three years ago, four years ago, I was in Russia doing a different hour-long program about politics. And I was with a Russian camera crew that I've worked with a number of times over the years. They live in Moscow, but they speak good English. And we're driving along, and we happen to be going right by the headquarters of an organization called United Russia, which is not a sports franchise. It is the, it, that's Putin's political party, United Russia. And they have a, I don't know, four, five, six-story headquarters building. We're driving by, and there's a demonstration. There are men, all men holding signs saying something in Cyril, I, I, you know, I can't read Russian, but it's, and I said to the cameraman, what is it? And he, he pulled over and he said, some sort of demonstration about property rights or something. I said, let's go find out. So we parked and we get out of the car and the cameraman, um, I mean, they're standing there openly and right across from Putin's political party headquarters. The cameraman grabs his, ca cameramen have cameras sewn to their shoulders. So he grabs his camera, and as soon as they see him get out with the camera, the leader of the group, what turned out to be the leader of this group of men, 20, 25 men, starts shouting, not angrily, but passionately, to the other men who are holding the signs. And I said to the, my cameraman, what's he saying? He said, There's, he's saying, get your heels off the grass. They were standing on a sidewalk, paved sidewalk. And right behind the sidewalk was, you know, maybe three feet of grass before I don't remember what was behind that, because what I remember is, get your feet off the grass. In the old days, remember what I told you about Gorky Square? They just put their feet, there was no grass, it was December, but they put their feet on the public property and those people were bundled away, not because they were going to put a flower at the foot of the statue, that was not illegal, but because they despoiled public property, that was the charge. Despoiling public property by putting their feet, so these guys, now this is, you know, 20 years later, 25 years later or something like that. They realized that they couldn't get it, they shouldn't get in trouble, probably wouldn't get in trouble for having a protest. And I'll tell you in a moment what it was about. But they could get in trouble if so much as their heel were to touch the grass because that would be used as a pretext for arresting them. The protest, by the way, was this. They were from a city 200 kilometers outside of Moscow. And they all worked in a plant, in a factory, and they always parked for free on an empty lot. And United Russia, the political party, was going to build a regional headquarters building 
on that lot. That was their protest. They said, don't do this. You know, this is where we parked to go to work. That's all it was about. So that, you know, you can get away with things today that you couldn't have gotten away with many years ago. But there is still that climate of fear. There is still that memory. And there is still, in fact, that climate of the law. So the liberties for which people yearned for decades came and went. They didn't all go away, but basically what they got at best didn't last for a single generation. Uh, one of Putin's uh, uh, opponents said this to me in Moscow a couple of years ago. He said, Putin has squeezed the life out of Russian democracy. But, and this is the part that's critical to understand, democracy means different things to different people. Even in this country, probably, it's fair to say, but certainly around the world. I'm going to spend, I'm going to digress for a couple of minutes because we're going to hear about democracy in March. In the Middle East, in Iraq, that's the best example. In Iraq, they have democracy, remember, people voted, but it's winner-take-all democracy. You know, once you win, you get everything. In Venezuela, I interviewed H the late Hugo Chavez. To Venezuela, another country having big problems as we speak. But I asked him something. I mean, we, we were down there doing, there was a recall election, and the recall people lost big time. And I asked him, because I had heard a lot of stories about buying votes. It was like being in Chicago. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, that is our form of democracy. Don't knock it. It's survival of the fittest. If we can pay more, buy more votes than someone else, that's what we do. So that's a different kind of democracy. Saudi Arabia, they will tell you, um, democracy means too much of a good thing. You know, why rock the boat? So when we were doing this program about politics in Russia just a few years ago, I went to the Duma, the, lo the lower house of their Congress, where people were still elected. And I had made an appointment to interview, a camera interview, um, one of the most outspoken dissidents left in Congress there. He was a man who was just not afraid to speak his mind, and he was a, quote, liberal. And we talked about all kinds of interesting things, but the answer he gave me to one particular question was fascinating. It's about democracy. And I'm going to simplify the question. I want you to think I ask elegant questions, but basically the simplification is, how does Putin get away with this stuff? You know, he takes away elections. He reduces political parties down to a half dozen or so. He, 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 he muzzles the media. How does he get away with it? My assumption being, after yearning for so long for democracy, that people would not stand for it, that somehow there would be rebellion. I don't mean armed rebellion, but rebellion of some kind. But I figured wrong, because here's what the guy said to me. And I'm giving you in his, he spoke pretty good English, but I'm going to give it to you exactly as he said it. Russians in the 90s had key problems. The economy fell down. Incomes fell down. Corruption grew up. Many things were terrible, and name for that was democracy. So when you see democracy through that lens, it's a little easier to understand how Putin has gotten in a way with democracy's uh, slow deterioration. He even got a law passed just a couple of years ago defining high treason. High treason is any move against Russia's constitutional order or sovereignty or state integrity. In common language, that means you, 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 you protest something publicly, you say something critically about the leadership. That can be high treason. Exhibit B is pussy riot. I don't know if you know it. I just read this morning in the New York Times online Today, Sochi time, which is where it's now tomorrow, two members of Pussy Riot had shown up in Sochi. They were arrested, allegedly for theft. Maybe they did steal something. I don't know. My guess is that there's more to it than that. Basically, though, Pussy Riot and others made the mistake of stepping on the grass. Well, they knew what they were doing, but you know, they stepped on the grass, and they paid for it. They, they were in jail for two years, and now they might be facing more. They were released already? Okay. So they can produce some of that rotten music. Oh, well. <laughs> but, you know, Putin set them I mean, right before Christmas, and the other prisoners free, and all the speculation comes down to the same conclusion. His motives? Because the focus of the world was going to be on Russia. So, you know, reduce if you don't eliminate and can't eliminate. 
you know, current news about political oppression. Some things he can't change. I'm going to check the time, by the way, because I know I'll, I'll try to talk for like 15 more minutes and leave 15 for questions. Is that okay? Okay, thanks. Um, you know, he couldn't change the shoddy construction in Sochi. And we've all, my favorite picture is the one of the two toilets in one stall. But my second favorite, I don't know if any of you saw it, but everybody has different favorites, is one toilet, and this is not in a public restroom, it's in obviously a bathroom of some kind. And so there's one toilet here, so I'm sitting here on the toilet, excuse my demonstration, and closer than the end of these risers, there are three chairs, just like the ones you're sitting in, facing the toilet. Like, you know, I'd like to have an audience. But th and then there's a lot of shoddy construction, some incomplete construction. They only knew this thing was coming for seven years, and yet they, they didn't get it finished. But there's a bigger s problem with infrastructure in Russia. And the infrastructure, when I say infrastructure, I mean the very places where people live. Uh, plenty of you have been there, you said. You've, uh, others probably been in other parts of what used to be the Eastern Bloc. It's like right after World War II, I mean, they had a big baby boom. Russia, percentage-wise, had a bigger baby boom you know, for the population than we had here in the United States because all Russian men were conscripted. And so they all came home at the same time and made babies. And so they hired one architect. He drew one set of plans, and they built them all over Russia and all over Eastern Europe. Not really, but that's what it looks like. And you've seen them, perhaps. And they look like what we used to call projects in major American cities, which we built to house the poor, usually minorities. But then we found they didn't work. They were petri dishes for drugs and, and, and crime and so forth. So we ripped them down and found other ways to house the poor. But there they can't because they, everyone lives in them. I mean, not everyone. But much of the urban middle class lives in these things. And you'll see them outside of Prague, and you'll see them in what used to be East Berlin as well. But I, I've been in a number of them. I'm going to describe one to you, just so you understand the difference between how people there live and how you live. You know, we're, most of us in this room are middle class. Imagine this. In this apartment, there were four people living there. Father, mother, 20-year-old daughter, 12-year-old son. Three rooms. A bedroom which had a double bed and a single bed and a chest of drawers, a bureau. A uh, living room, which had a couch, a coffee table, and two chairs, and then kitchen slash bathroom with a shower curtain between them. What I haven't told you is that the whole place was 450 square feet. You know, they told me in meters they knew, and I just did my little conversion. 450 square feet. I was, uh, when I was single, I was in a studio apartment. That was 450 square feet, so I know exactly how much space it is. But these are four people. The parents and the 12-year-old sleep in the bedroom, and there is no room to walk and no room for a chair. So if they have to go in there, they sit on the bed or lay on the bed, lie on the bed. My wife would have corrected me. And they have to go in there sometimes because the daughter is 20. She wants her privacy, and she's in the living room because that, hide -bed, that, that sofa is a hide-a-bed. You know, it folds out. And when it folds out, there's no room for a table, so there's no table in. This family has no place for the four of them to sit around a table and eat and talk. And when somebody from the bedroom has to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, which is the other side of the living room, they have to literally crawl over her bed, 450 square feet. Putin can't correct that. Not that there's been a lot of focus on it, but he can't fix that basic residential infrastructure of the country. Some of these buildings like this are 18 stories tall. Some are lower than that. But they all, be and when, when they were built in the Soviet days, by the way, there were no services. There were no groceries, no doctors and dentists, there were no laundries. There were just bus stops. But there was no sense, you know, that was central planning in the Soviet days. There was no sense of, you know, we're going to put thousands of people here, let's give them the services that people need near their homes. So Putin can't correct that. He also, he did correct the ban on public protests. You know, at first they weren't going to allow them in Sochi, and then they said, we'll allow them, but you have to get a permit. You know where they allow them? It's a park in another town about eight, nine, ten miles away from Sochi. <laughs> and according to a journalist I know who is there, and I emailed him just a couple of days ago to, because I was going to talk tonight, you know, where, what's happened with that? 
There have been very few protests. There have been a lot of applications. And when somebody came to apply to, uh, for a license to protest in this park, well beyond the site of anybody in Sochi, they've been, as, as, my, as my friend put it, shall we say discouraged. <laughs> now, there might be at the end. You know, it, it remains to be seen. But Putin you know, removed or at least re reduced the opportunities for the world to see and complain about human rights in Russia. If I have to guess, I'm going to guess that the moratorium on penalties won't last long. And pretty soon in Russia, if you say I'm gay, or if you criticize the president, um, or if you step on the grass, you might be in trouble again. Which raises a question. If Putin's such a bad guy, how does he get away with this? Well, I already told you about the, the Russian view of democracy. So you can take away democracy because when the Soviet Union fell apart and Russia you know, began to blossom, democracy wasn't always a good thing because corruption grew and inflation grew and so forth. Unemployment grew. But the other word that helps to explain it is the word nationalism. Nationalism basically, I mean, we're nationalists. All Americans are nationalists. It means pride in your country, pride in your, in your country's power, in your country's achievements, in your country's innovation in your country's history. And the Peruvians are great nationalists. If you've ever been to Peru, you know that. They're very proud of what, what the Incas did and, and the Inca culture, which extends to this day, and terracing at Machu Picchu for agriculture and so forth. The Egyptians are very proud, even though, I mean, what they're proud of is the accomplishments of their ancestors thousands of years ago. But they built those pyramids with you know, blocks that were half as big as this room. And we don't know to this day how they did. They, they invented paper, papyrus, and the mummification of corpses. The Iraqis are very proud. You know, Iraq was the heart of the Mesopotamian Empire. It's the cradle of civilization, some uh, describe it, 10,000 years ago. And the Russians are nationalists. They have a lot to be proud of in terms of culture, in terms of a history of power, and in terms of their achievements. But Putin is playing nationalism like a Stradivarius violin. We did another program there, probably six, seven years ago now, about an organization called NASHI. NASHI in Russian means our people, our team, ours, O-U-R-S, ours, something like that. And this is an organization of young people, high school and college age, that numbers in the tens of thousands of members whose sole per it's financed by and organized through the Kremlin, and their sole purpose, as I got together with a group of them in a city called Vladimir, uh, 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 which is a few hundred miles outside of Moscow, we sat together all night talking about what they're doing. And I said, well, you know, what's your primary goal? And one girl spoke for them all. They all said they agreed. She said, it is to promote, all right, not to promote, to improve the morality, the work ethic, and the level of patriotism in our country. And I asked them to define each of those. Patriotism meant, I, I, and one of them was, they were very straightforward. You know, they didn't have guile. I say this with admiration for you guys in high school. They hadn't developed guile yet. So she said, well, patriotism means promoting the policies of Putin. <laughs> and that sounds fine if you do it all in speeches and papers. But some of these members of Nashi were thugs. And they went out on the streets and they beat people up and put people in cars. There were even some kidnappings because there were people who didn't conform to the ideals of Nashi. So nationalism can be misdirected because what Putin, you know, these are young people who came of age. The, today's high school and college students are the first generation to come of age since the breakup of the Soviet Union. They have not been told so much, and these Nashi students told me this, they have not been told so much about the bad old days of communism as they have about the good old days of superpowerism. The days when Soviet Union spoke and the world trembled. The days when the United States had a rival for influence around the world. The days when they had respect. And they want that back. And it's not just members of Nashi, it's people of all ages. Not all people, but plenty of people want that. And that's what Putin is giving them. And even the Olympics are a symbol of that yearning for, na you know, that nationalistic yearning. We're big, we're back, we're good at what we do. And when you think about it, they've done pretty well. You know, Putin, 
Putin, when, when the Olympics were awarded to Russia seven or eight years ago, he was quoted saying something like, it's a judgment on our country. And he meant it in a very positive way. And in some ways it is. He hasn't liked all the judgments. You know, Obama and the leaders of, of Britain and Germany and France, they didn't even go. That was a first class snub. There have been plenty of stories about corruption, plenty of stories about overspending, plenty of stories about shoddy construction, plenty of stories about human rights. Those don't reflect well on him. But what does reflect well on him is that he pulled it off. And you know what? They did build some Olympic venues that are apparently second to none. And they've staged the games, in my opinion, very well. And I'm a sort of winter sports kind of guy. Um, you'd think that it would be enough to make the man smile. <laughs> but no such luck. Greg, what's happened to Dmitry Medvedev? Uh, he has been not silenced. He, he's the man who was the prime minister. And then, because you couldn't succeed yourself, he became the president. But he always reportedly reported to Putin. He's the prime minister again. That's the answer. Nobody's heard of him, uh, from him. I mean, really. But mind you, the prime minister in Russia, you know, we don't have a, a presidential slash prime ministerial system. Very few countries do, interestingly. But the president is the power. It's sort of like a mayor and a city manager. But the mayor has the power, the city manager is the administrator. He makes sure that the cabinet level departments work. That's what I've been told. Next. I, I have it. Oh. The microphone's over here. <laughs> it's like, went out. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and stand. Okay. So they were talking about how the Canadian ice dance team had to move from Russia, where they were for three years, to the United States because the Russians like closed it off to just the Russians. Why do you think they did that? Did, do you think they didn't really trust other countries being in their ice time, I guess? I've got it? to apologize for my answer. But as a journalist, even though everything I've just spent the last 45 minutes saying might uh, put the lie to what I'm going to say to you, I don't know, and it's not mine to guess. I, I don't know. That's a good question. I've sort of wondered about the same thing. That, and there are other scenarios along those lines. All we, I mean, you know, having said I won't guess, I'm going to offer you this theory. <laughs> but it's only because I've already talked about it. nationalism. Nationalism and nationalism. I mean, that really does trump almost everything else in Russia, maybe even more today than in the Soviet Union. Days. I, I, I apologize that I can't give you more than that. Okay, we'll have another one here and work our way that way. Um, my question is, how, what, what is the difference between, say, an eight-year-old dreaming in an American city today and a Russian kid dreaming in a Russian city? Less of a difference than there used to be. Before your time, when the Soviet Union broke up, there were, there were people who figured out that they could, this phrase I would use is grab the brass ring. That's an old, it's an old phrase from the days when people went around on a merry-go-round at an amusement park, and you grabbed the brass ring and you got cotton candy for free or something like that. There are, I mean, there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, entrepreneurial activity, plenty of capitalistic profit to be had. In the old days in Moscow and uh, all over the Eastern Bloc, Warsaw and so forth, I don't think I ever saw a neon sign. Well, there, was neon, there were neon signs, but the sign would say candy. It wouldn't say, you know, Peter, what, what uh, candy maker, you know, Hershey's. It wouldn't say her, wouldn't be brand <laughs> because the state produced everything or bought everything from outside. Today, I mean, it's amazing, in Moscow, Red Square, you've heard of Red Square, which is this great big parade ground in front of the main entrance to the Kremlin. And there used to be an old department store there called GUM, G-U-M. It was an acronym, and I don't remember the Russian. But, and it was a mess. I mean, it was physically a mess. It, people took no pride in their job. There used to be a phrase in, in the Soviet Union, which was, uh, we pretend to work, and they pretend to pay us. <laughs> so that's sort of how it was at this department store. That store. I'm from the city of San Francisco. There used to be a chocolate factory called Ghirardelli. You still know Ghirardelli. But today it's, I mean, it has been for 30 or 40 years, boutique shops and tourist shops and so forth. Goom is that now. And there's Tiffany's is there. And Yves Saint Laurent is there. So there are plenty of opportunities for young people in Russia. Politically, 
I mean, Barack Obama is living proof that anybody can grow up dreaming, dream, dreaming of being an American president. You're better off if you come from a family with a name like Kennedy or Bush or Clinton, but anybody can dream that. You've got to toe the line and play the game unless things change in the future in Russia. And you've already heard the reasons why. It's a great question. I hope I've given you at least a sketch of what I think is the answer. Thank you. Another question. Uh, what do you think this uh, president, what's his name? Vladimir Putin? Yeah. What is he afraid of losing if he's not so oppressive? Or is he somewhat oppressive because that's all Russia has known? <laughs> it's a good question. You're asking for speculation. Far be it for me to speculate, but here's the precise answer. <laughs> no. no, I'm just kidding. Um, I think it's, it's more the latter. It's what he knows. You heard the question about the man who was the president and is once again the prime minister. He comes from that culture, but he wasn't in the KGB, which was there. It's now the F something. Who remembers? F something D. But their security service. Sort of combination of FBI and CIA. Um, so A, I mean, he comes from that culture where Med Medvedev does not. Uh, number two, he's just a harsh guy. Remember, he's the man with no face. And so I, I think it's just in his DNA that he wants to shape the nation. I mean, Russia is enjoying a self-renewal. They're back on the world stage. Think of the areas in which we differ today. I characterize Putin's foreign policy this way. And this is simplistic, and I, I'm not naive, but well, maybe I am. But basically, anything he can do to thumb his nose at the United States. So on Syria, we're, of course, on different sides. On Iran, we're on different sides. On the Ukraine, where they have a very direct interest, as you heard from Joe, we're on very different sides. On the issue of gay rights, we're on different sides. On um, the adoption of orphans. You know, he cut off the adoption of, I was in an orphanage in a city in eastern Russia uh, probably seven or eight years ago. And these poor little kids, I mean, any poor kid in an orphanage is a poor little kid, but there was one staff for every 22 kids. So there were kids in cribs who hardly got touched once or twice a day. I mean, they, they, they could really use some adoptions there. And Americans were adopting them, and he cut it off in a fit of pique. And of course, Edward Snowden, that's another difference between us. So, you know, hopefully that answers the question. Question in the center yeah. here. In another well-timed release a couple of months ago, Hordakovsky was pardoned. I, 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 Hordakovsky, yeah, the so oil know. baron. Right, right. And uh, there was apparently a, uh, he essentially ambushed um, Putin in the Duma, I believe, and asked him a most provocative question. Uh, I suspect you have a, a view or two on that. Please tell us about it. Well, this guy was jailed for corruption, probably rightly so. But from what I have learned when I've made my visits there, almost everybody who grabbed that brass ring in the early days did it with corruption. Corruption was a way of life. It's, there's, there are different levels of corruption in different countries, and in some countries it's far more visible and, and in fact, endemic than it is in Russia. But the people who did that were corrupt. But if they didn't speak out against Vladimir Putin, then they stayed free and made their money. So, you know, it's not the first time charges have been trumped up. In the Soviet days, sometimes the charges weren't trumped up because their constitution was blatantly uh, void of human rights. Russia's constitution is not. So they have to find other excuses. I mean, everything I'm saying to you is speculation, I mean, opinion, analysis, but maybe I know a little more than the man on the street, so that's my best guess. Thank you. Our next question. Greg, you talked about how does Putin get away with it, and the one thing you didn't address was economics, and when the wall fell in 91 and Russia collapsed shortly thereafter, the Russian economy was a mess. Uh, they defaulted on their sovereign debt. Mm. Uh, today, Russian has a positive balance of payments. They've got $650 million, billion dollars in reserves. It's becoming less positive as we speak. It is. Uh, the ruble is traded internationally today. And I'm just wondering how much of Putin's success is related to economics. 
uh, and whether you think that the standard of living for the average Russian, um, I know Moscow has become an international city, real estate mm -hmm. prices are as high as anywhere in the world. Um, I'm wondering if, if you think the one possible explanation for Putin's success has been economics and whether the average Russian feels better off today than he did in 1991. Can't speak for the average Russian, but I'll give it my best shot. The average Russian economically is not a whole lot better off. They have more consumer goods than they ever had. I mean, if you've been in, if you went to the Soviet Union, I won't say Russia, the Soviet Union, you went into a, a grocery store, they had cabbage, they had, uh, what are those black things, uh, eggplant, carrots, <laughs> and maybe half a dozen other things, period. I mean, don't picture Whole Foods here. <laughs> so they have more consumer goods to choose from. The streets of Moscow, the streets of St. Petersburg, whereas I could have done push-ups in the middle of that ring road in front of the Kremlin, today you'd be lucky to move your car 10 feet in 10 seconds during rush hour. Lots of people have cars. So yeah, people are better off. I, my opinion is that those aren't the average, when you talk about the average Russians, the average Russians, urban Russians, by the way, you know, it's kind of like China. If you read about China, you know that, what have they got, a billion point one people, and something like 300 million of them are doing pretty darn well, but that leaves 800 million who aren't. Out in the countryside, the proportions aren't the same in Russia, but a lot of people aren't doing any better than they ever were, don't have electricity and don't have running water and don't have indoor plumbing. You'll see those places if you take a train from uh, Moscow to, to, to St. Petersburg. So if, if what we would call the, economically the lower middle class in this country um, is doing pretty well because everyone has two cars and a TV and, and a computer, they're, they're, the average Russian doesn't have all that. Not yet. Best I can do. Next question here. So in light of the games, especially now, in your opinion, would you say that under the Obama administration, US and Russia relations have improved or worsened? And more importantly, why? Would you tell us that? <laughs> oh, easily I can tell you that. Sure. <laughs> um, I, think th I think clearly they've worsened. They've worsened because more issues have come up. They've worsened because the world has worsened. and. Because of the economy and because of shaking off the failures of the, of, of the 90s, the Russians have had the opportunity to show their flag again. And that puts them in direct conflict with the United States. What's more, I mean, I had a column in uh, the Denver Post Sunday in the perspective section, and I'm, I'm, I'm a Democrat. I voted for Obama both times, and by and large, I'll take Obama over the men he ran against. But I was critical. It was about Syria. And I said, Obama has dithered. And when it comes to foreign policy and foreign affairs, too often, in my opinion, Obama has dithered. Dithered meaning hesitated, been scared to take action. As a result, you know, somebody fills the void. It's like they say about a vacuum. Somebody fills the void. The United States, in my view, and I'm not the only one who feels this way, has to be, a, if, if we're going to be a power, some people would say we don't need to be a power anymore. Our, you know, empire is in decline. But if we're going to continue to be a power for good, we have to keep skin in the game. That's why we're, you know, John Kerry's still trying to bring sides together in the Middle East, uh, the, the, the real Middle East, the, the, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Every president since, and including Richard Nixon, who was elected in 1968, has tried to bring peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Every single one of them. And everyone has failed. Obama, through John Kerry, might fail, might succeed. At some point, it might happen. I've covered a lot of those negotiations. If I had to put money on it, I would guess that it's not going to because of some core issues of conflict. But the point is, the United States has to do it. Because if we don't, and I think this is addresses your question, somebody else does. That's why I use the phrase skin in the game. If we don't, somebody else does. And then they help shape a world that might be even tougher than the world we're shaping. Any others? Anybody on this side? I know the microphones. We've got one more oh, question okay. here and then I'm, I'm going to I, I apologize. Time. If you want to get up and leave because you want to get up and leave, uh, <laughs> please go ahead. I won't be, won't be hurt. Uh, since, since you've moved to the Middle East, I have a question on the Middle East. Wait, since I, oh, <coughs> to the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, the Middle East. I will never move to the Middle East. Uh, okay. 
I was telling somebody at dinner in the Middle East, I'll come to you in a moment, in Egypt in particular, which is probably Egypt and Iran are the two countries in the Middle East where I've spent more time than in any others. And in Egypt, uh, you know, there are different forms of Arabic, but in classical Arabic, the word for uh, tomorrow is bukra. But it's awfully hard to get things done in Egypt. I mean, harder these days, of course. But even back in the, in the day when things seemed to be thriving. You know, was a, we, we, journalists used to joke that bukra meant the same thing as manana, but without the sense of urgency. So <laughs> I will never. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I know you don't like to forecast. And, and Yogi Berra said that forecasting is easy except for the part that it's deals that, with the future. That's right. Uh, um, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, give us your best forecast on what Syria is going to be like in 2020, what would that forecast be? I'll answer the question as you asked me to forecast. The, the, the forecast would be Assad and a divided nation where he's still fighting off the elements who have you know, acquired the power to control their little segments of the country. And they're not going to give it up easily. I mean, in my column, frankly, I said, look, it's going to work, work out one of three ways. It's either going to be Assad in charge, or it's going to be the bad guy rebels in charge, or it's going to be the good guy rebels in charge. But I see it in that order of likelihood. And that's why I said Obama <coughs> dithered in that column. That was this, this column on Sunday. Because earlier on, you know, it's literally three years ago, I think Monday is the anniversary of the first protest in a, in a marketplace. You know, it, as the Syrian manifestation of the Arab Spring. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I think Assad's going to win because nobody has stopped him. But he's not going to, I mean, first of all, so much of the infrastructure of the country is gone. So much of the population of the country is gone. And he's not going to let those people back. If they left, then almost by definition, they a, left because yeah. they were escaping a place he was besieging. It's pathetic. So, so I, uh, I'll begin with, um, I have a slight disagreement with you in skin in the game. Uh, because the skin in the game that you've talked about is at what cost? It's been a great cost to this country. So when you try to change that vision or that approach to how you establish yourself or your mission, what this country is about, the greatness of the country, I think you've got to be careful about skin in the game. I, I really do. Well, but what, do a, what do you mean a slight disagreement? <laughs> So my, qu but my, my, state, my question is, I, I'm just disagreeing with what you said no, before. No, no, fine. But the question is, how do you see life after Putin? I have no idea. I mean, I spent how a does, lot of time, you, I, I'll, I'll give you the answer by way of a parallel. And I don't know, I, I'd have to think it through, and maybe I'll be sorry I offered this. I spent a lot of time in Poland in, when was it? Uh, late 70s, early 80s, which was the Solidarity Trade Movement. You might recall that uh, Lech Wałęsa, who became the president of the country, was a shipyard worker in the northern city of Gdansk, which used to be called Dansk. And, I mean, used to be called uh, Danzig. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were agitating for certain, sort of call them union rights. And they won. The, the, the Polish government ceded some rights to them, and the, the movement grew across the country. And Russia, I should say, the Soviet Union finally went to General Jaruzelski, who was the military, Polish military leader of the country, president of the country, and said, bring an end to this. And he did. And then there were two or three dark years of martial law. And I spent time there during the heyday of the trade union and then during the days of martial law. And people said to me, we've tasted it. We've tasted democracy. We're not going to forget it. We don't know how long this will last. We don't know how we're going to get it back. But we won't forget it. And of course they didn't. And they got it back. And they, I mean, Poland more than any other Eastern Bloc country was responsible for its own renewal. Um, so if, if you see where, why, why I offer that parallel, that's the best hope. You know, uh, 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 everybody but the, the Gen Xers in Russia today remembers those 10 years, those nine or 10 years, when democracy flourished. Who knows what, what powers they'll be up against.
Thank you. And if you Thank enjoyed you. the program tonight, please take the copy of your program on your chair with and share it with a friend. We always welcome guests. Let's thank Mr. Greg Dobbs for being here. Thank you.